And welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Danny Cannell. That's Bud Elliott. That's Tom Fernelli. I'm Chip Patterson. We got Danny in Tallahassee in the Sidewinder, the Seminole Sidewinder, stunting on everybody. We'll get to that in just a little bit. We've got some Pac-12 uh, quarterbacks that are on the move. And we want to take a look through the history of college football and try and identify some of the most important developments that have helped shape the sport. It could be things on the field, like, I don't know, the forward pass. It could be things off the field, around the sport, uh, start to co- start to discuss that and sort of see how things are changing. But college football is changing very, very rapidly. And so I, I wanted to begin just circling back to what I think is probably one of our uh, – most well-received episodes because without a knowledge that the college football playoff uh, stakeholders were going to come out on Thursday and essentially say, Hey, yep, this whole 12 team thing, we're going through it that, you know, who needs an emergency podcast when you have like 59 minutes of audio gold already in the can already in the feed for all of the listeners where I, I think we did a pretty good job of, uh, of getting out our different stances of, of being able to show the different pieces of this conversation. So as, with some time to like, we are starting to hear coaches uh, discuss, you know, their reactions to it, uh, you know, all, all the winners and losers, and, and there's all the different um, uh, ways to attack the, the actual announcement and, you know, still some, some time that uh, is yet to be had before we get the final details but have have any opinions changed or what has really stood out to you as we start to think about uh, the future of this 12 team college football playoff? I just chime in here because this is perfectly appropriate, appropriate for the conversation. Literally like we had already just signed on to like, say what's up to our zoom here that we record on. And a buddy of mine texts me, didn't know, like I didn't even know he listened to cover three. And here's the text, which I could not agree with more. Oh, no. Tom Fornelli made zero sense in y'all's playoff podcast. You were spot on with basically everything. And I could not agree with my guy, Josh, any more than that text that he just sent. So shout out to my guy, Josh, with the reinforcement. Because I feel like Fornelli, and I don't know if Barrett Salee is as much on it. He prefers the four. But I feel like you two are the only like holdovers who are just like firm in the like you guys have laid it down. You are not budging and you are never going to like the expansion. I. If you want two NFLs, but one's not as good as the other, (laughs) then you're going to love playoff expansion because that's what they're turning college football into. They're turning it into another NFL, but without the same quality of football and this, the stuff that makes college football great has never been the playoff. For some reason, college football went just fine for 125 years before the BCS ever came around, and it's been going fine without a 12-team playoff. People just demand stuff that they want because they want new things. And again, this is just change. It's not progress. It doesn't fix mm. anything. It's going to create more problems more than not in all likelihood, and it's going to improve some things, but it's going to create many different problems, and we're not going to be happy with it in seven years, and we're going to want to change that one too, and blah, 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 and so on and so on. So I don't hate, like I, I've talked about, I don't hate having a 12-team playoff. I'm going to be watching these games. It's just, it's not really going to change anything. It's going to be the same teams winning it every single time and the idea that well now teams are going to have hope yeah that's going to be fun for them for a few years until that hope turns into well all right cool let's go get our ass kicked by alabama that's going to get tired really quickly and teams aren't going to be all that thrilled about it so great (laughs) enjoy it well i don't know we already did this podcast i think like we don't want to rehash all of it (laughs) i appreciate like that Tom is like my mentions come to life if my mentions went to college. Like they actually made like they, they made a cogent argument. I don't necessarily agree with the argument, but it's not just nonsensical batshit craziness coming out of his mouth. Like I do think the idea that people are going to get tired of losing to Alabama is Oklahoma tired of making the playoff. No, they make the playoff all the time and then they get absolutely drugged, and that's okay. You know, like I, I think people are going to be if you followed your team all year and it's got a shot to make the playoff. Your rationality is out the door, man. You are believing in that team. We see this all the time. Like, we got a shot. I'm like, what? Like, just because you guys got here doesn't mean you have a shot. But good luck telling them that. I think the passion and the support for that team in that given year uh, will will be there. I 
honestly, like I'd be okay with going back to two. I just think four was the wrong number. Um, I mean, they're antsy. Like it's, have you ever rearranged the furniture in a room just to mix it up? I, I just, I kind of think that it's like that collective uh, anxiety and antsy feeling among the power brokers where you're like, oh, uh -oh I don't, I don't like, I don't like this. Let's, uh, let's do this, 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 you move this couch over here and do this and, and then we'll be good. And you're right. I mean, that change in progress debate is something that we will only know with time. We're only going to know once we actually like get it out and start the new format. But the feeling with how quickly all of this has moved because at first it was like, you're never going to see expansion before the end of the contract in 2025. And now all of a sudden, not only is this moving quickly, but it could be in 2023. It definitely feels like an anxiety or an antsiness to just rearrange the furniture just to, and see what happens. I do think I know how they're going to screw the G5 teams. Like we've seen these models that show they're going to get two G5 teams oh, yeah. in the playoff. No way. No, no chance. Way. No. Like the back <laughs> testing is not going to match up. And Coastal Carolina, would have been, Coastal Carolina would have magically been ranked 13th last year. Right. That's it would have never been in the top 12. Okay. Right. So I, I agree they'll rig it, but I think I figured out how they're going to rig it. Okay. And if, if you look at these future schedules, a lot of these teams have been loading up on really difficult games. We are going to have more, you know, two loss SEC championship type records coming out, especially in the latter half of this decade. I think they're going to, this actually could be a positive if the committee starts to use smart metrics a little more rather than nonsense like yards per game and stuff that doesn't control for you know opponent quality or context. If they lean into some of the opponent adjusted numbers a little more and start to, to really focus on strength of record, strength of schedule, things like that, that will pretty much just vaporize the chance of a second G5 team getting in unless they go and do like, like what I've always told Boise they should do which is do what Florida state did in, in, in the late seventies, early eighties, where they, they played like four top 10 teams in back to back weeks in 1980, 80 or 81. Danny, remember when they played like Pitt and Marino and then Georgia and then somebody else and, and somebody else, you know, if somebody does a barnstorming tour like that and comes out 11 and one, 12 and 0. Okay. But I, I think that's the way they'll do it. Um, and I think that's fine to be honest. It's I mean, we're going to have more good games scheduled if the committee will demonstrate that we're not going to rank just on record like they do now, but that they'll rank a little more based on strength of schedule. If they continue to rank based on record, then, I, you know, I hate it. They won't. I just think they'll manipulate the rating. I think they'll manipulate the rankings and they can, and that's again, assuming, which I'm assuming there will be another selection committee. They can have criteria, which is just, I don't want to say confusing, but just flexible enough to where they can justify one group of five. But I still think one group of five is better than zero where they don't have any chance. Now they actually can. And Jamie Chadwell talked about this. I saw he did an interview. I think it was with ESPN. And he said, now when I look at recruits, I can actually tell them we could win a national championship. You know, I know we could all roll our eyes and say, what are the chances you guys beat Bama? But I do think it's meaningful that he can actually tell his players, yeah, we can, we can make the playoff and we can play on a national stage and we can be a part of those promo, uh, promos that are made. And we're actually a part of those, not just in word. Danny, what you was your see? friend's name? My boy, Josh. Josh. Uh, yeah, yeah, Josh. All right, here, this is for you and Josh. So you don't like the selection committee because you're pretty sure they're going to rig things, right? <laughs> so I, now you want to give the selection committee more teams to choose more to rig so we're taking these things that we don't like and our solution to fixing it is to add more of it no yeah, but there a was great a great idea no but here's the and to put the analogy to the furniture where it's going to be and moving the furniture around like what we've had is essentially we've had this futon right in the doorway that everybody trips over when they come in and then everybody's crowded and everybody's in a bad mood because you're in, you started off on the wrong foot and now like, we're going to put a queen size bed there instead <laughs> no no we're not <laughs> so now we've moved it off to the side now it's more welcoming we're more we're going to have more people in there and yes i agree with you people will still complain about it but there were some things that really were hard to swallow. They're just sending a Power Five conference champion a deserving. Now I get and see this is where I think it gets good because just because you win the Pac-12 and this was something real hard that I had a, a hard time with when you went all right if we went five automatic Power Five conference champs what was the biggest pushback? Oh well, what if there's an eight and four Pac-12 champ or an eight and four ACC champ? 
this protects against that so that you don't just get rewarded as Barrett Salee likes to say, oh, you know, mediocrity and we want to have excellence in there. We protect against that by having an open criteria where it'll be the six highest power, or not power five, six it's highest conference champions. champions. So you could potentially, if the Pac-12 is garbage or the ACC is garbage and they don't have a worthy one, then you could go to the American, you could go to wherever where the more worthy uh, champion would be. Hell yeah, we won't have any eight and four conference champs, but we will have some nine and three teams that finish third in their division. We are not re rewarding mediocrity anymore. Woo! Did, did you see Kirby Smart's uh, quote on this, by the way? Yeah, I was confused. What What do you think about it? So he said, uh, "Quote." He went to the strength of schedule. Part yeah, of this is this is on the uh, uh, Ryan McGee show. Um, good Marty good McGee. Marty McGee. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of this is going to boil down to the strength of schedule. Smart told Marty McGee for a long time now. We've been trying to build up our future strength of schedule because it's not the losses that are going to kill you. It's not playing the best teams at will. We tried to go out and schedule major P5s across our scheduling system all the way out with the hopes that this would really give us the opportunity to go play some really good teams. And losses won't kill you when you start talking about top 12. You've got to have a powerful schedule and play good teams. If they're for ranking you on wins as opposed to you know overly penalizing you for losses, I'm, in, I'm into that. That creates the incentive to schedule more good games in the regular season. I see. I, my fear is that we're going to see kind of the opposite. Like maybe that's what you say now, but I think that I worry that over time after this starts, the effect will be teams not as willing to schedule big opponents like in non-conference games. Same because time. They're, they're going to they like, well, you know what? If it's down between us and an eight and four team with a win over a top 10 team, but we're only nine and three, we're probably going to get selected more often. And I think that's going to be the case. So I do think that another long-term effect of this is, yeah, we'll get great games at the end of the year, quote unquote, great games. But I feel like September is going to be nothing but power fives versus FCS and G fives. Chip, the other thing you asked, like starting this conversation would have you changed, like, since we've learned more details, have you changed in your opinion? I will say, I don't know if I've changed my opinion because forever I've been Notre Dame, you know, sack up and join the ACC like the response that I had is Notre Dame is totally okay with this. Jack Swarbrick is one of the four that were presented this. He signed off on this and this actually is the best of both worlds for them. I was under the assumption, Ooh, if they can't get that four, that coveted four, uh, you know, buys the first round buys, then maybe they would want to join. So they get one of those. And I think their mindset was who cares? We don't have to play a championship game, ACC championship game we're still Notre Dame, like we'll sacrifice playing in this ACC championship game. And in its replacement, we'll get a home game for the first round of the playoff. Like, go ahead, do whatever you want. So I think as my, I thought Notre Dame was potentially a loser, I think mm -hmm. they might be a potential winner in this situation, as well as if you want to throw in BYU, Liberty, any other independents that could be in a situation where they're like, who cares about a buy? We just want access. Now we get it, and we don't have to join a conference. Yeah, can we at least all four of us agree that it is incredibly stupid and nonsensical that the the four teams that get a bye don't get a home game? Yeah, it doesn't yes, make any just sense. Absolutely. But you know why it is? Oh, I know. Yeah, it's the same reason we only had four in the original playoff. We got to keep the bowls happy. We got to keep the yeah, bowls yeah. happy. It's just it's. <laughs> It's it's ridiculous on its notion that like a team that earns a buy is then rewarded with a game in Dallas, whereas the team that squeaks in, you know, is like an at large gets to play at home against the 12 seed. Do you I think I, I hope that one's still like I and I was trying to, you know, talking to and you guys might know this as well, like just talking to different people that potentially are in the know, like how how lot how, is this in Sharpie or is this in pencil? My hope is that this is still in pencil and they could tweak possibly that scenario, but also knowing the power of the bowls. But like, I think it would be better if you had the first, I, I love them all on, on campus until the final four, but I just don't think we're going to get that. I wish it was open to conversation and maybe it will be, but ultimately those bowls hold way too much power. It's also uh, the path of least resistance from a logistics standpoint, because it, for four quarterfinals and two semifinals, that's six games. And how many New Year's bowl games do we have? Six. Can we just keep, we could keep the semifinal rotation as is, except instead of New Year's six bowls, those end up being your quarterfinals. Like logistically, I was like, oh, 
yeah, they're just going to do this. Like they've, we've already got our hotels uh, picked out. We've already got the relationships with the local sports consortiums in all of our different cities. We've already got all the restaurants. We've already got everything like set up. Don't shake that up. So uh, yeah, keeping the bowls happy makes me think that while it might be in pencil, I do think that I don't think it's as dumb. I, I, I don't agree, Tom. I don't think it's as dumb because it's one less game and one less game is healthier. You know, it is one less chance to lose. Even if it's losing an on-campus game, I do think the, there is an advantage to not having to play and to being that much closer to the final. Another, another aspect of this that I haven't really seen anyone talk about, and maybe this is getting too far in the weeds. Does this new format mean we're going to have less bowl games? Because, yes. Okay. Well, yeah. automatically, yes, because right? there's less participants, or you would have to go down really. So, no, or I you have mean, crappier mean, bowl games. <laughs> I, I just mean in the sense that why do so many bowl games exist? Who owns, who owns all these bowl games? ESPN. Many of them ESPN is. has them to fill time during December, like, you know, weekends, because there's no NFL. There's the college is obviously off. So if we're adding these rounds to the playoffs where that's an extra weekend of important games, because obviously they have to spread them out. Does ESPN just kind of uh, poop can a couple of the games that they currently have? So that way we're going to have fewer bowl games overall, because they're going to say, well, you know what, instead of having four, you know, of these games between G5 teams this Saturday, we'll just have our playoff game so we can just get rid of these bowls. Potentially, if the Rose Bowl plays nice, right? I mean, like, it, it, hasn't that always been the, the the thorn in the side of the? Uh, well, the Rose. But don't you gone. think the Rose Bowl's not going away? But I think the right. bowls no, that are going gonna away. It's not going to be what it wants. Right. No, it's not going to be what it wants. But when I think of bowls going away, I don't yeah. think of the any of bowls. the. Yes. I, I mean, mean, I mean, like the why do these bowls exist? Potato bowls dead. Like you know what I mean? Be. Yeah. These that won't be the first one. Like newer newer bowls that just started up will be on the chopping block. Bowls right. that like Boca Rotombo, who I which I like and love seeing where it is and played there. That one I think would be a prime example of one that could be in jeopardy. And I th I'm pretty sure ESPN owns it. You know, because there are a couple bowls that are run by independent, you know, committees or whatever you, you Sun know, whatever Bowl ain't going it. anywhere. Do, do we you still know? own the Sun Bowl? Yes. Nice. Wait. Um, I think the Sun. I don't think. I think CBS just has the rights to it. Well, we don't own okay. it. Yeah, we don't yeah, own yeah. it. Yeah. Because because ESPN has that whole like actual event management wing that does mm -hmm. straight up own the bowl just where they get to bowl negotiate games. all of it. Yeah. yeah. But these bowls exist primarily so that it's it's for inventory slotting over the holiday season when a lot of people actually are at home, you know, out of work or, or working part time, you know, sort of doing that, you know, uh, December hours type deal. They're traveling. They're you know they're they're at the in laws. They got family around. They they want to watch stuff and they're they're in the living room. That's basically why a lot of these exist. And if ESPN wants to uh, you know put those slots to the best and highest use, it easily could move a, a playoff game or two, you know, to there. I, I don't think they're married to certain dates. I just they they have to work at least as of now around when the Rose Bowl wants to have its parade and that it's uh, that the halftime or, or whatever third quarter is is timed up with the sunset. In the in the same way that it's like, uh, I think Bud, you first introduced the like, you know, it, choosing a champion. I, I I think this is worse. But if you're talking about me, the person who has to have content, this is good for me. College football used to abandon about half of December. We'd have our conference championship Saturday. We'd have our selection show. And you know what? I kind of liked it. All right. I would go out of town. I would go on a trip. I would take like an extra Friday or a Monday. And before the bowls really got cranked up, just, just have a little me time. That ain't happening. Somebody pointed out this is college football taking back the month of December and being like, no, we are going to be relevant all the way through the month. And it's going to be after our selection show, we've got these first round games to point to, then we've got to hold those first round games. And then it's going to set up the quarterfinals. Then it's going to set up the semifinals. So these other bowl games, some will get put on the chopping block. Some will still exist, but they will only exist to promote the first round and the quarterfinal games that are going to be coming up. Would Welcome to my world here. Uh, <laughs> as I, cause I was the only recruiting guy for SB nation. So I didn't ever, I really never got December off even before early signing period. I would go Alabama, Mississippi, all-star game, and then like oh, you know, yeah. the Florida game and then would hit the, you know, Under Armour game, which was like the 26th to the 30th and then had to fly to San Antonio, you know, for, cause that's basically didn't want to invest in anybody else. So I was like the only dude there, which worked out well career wise. 
<laughs> now we now, now we have early signing period too. Like now college football is all December. You, you guys ain't getting a break now. No, nah, this, this is it. <laughs> As like Christmas in January. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As college, diehard college football fans, would you rather like, cause we were saying ESPN is in it for the money. ESPN is in, you know, it's pretty well documented. Some of the issues they've had financially, it's going to be hard for them. Would you rather like see the Boca bowl, Cure Bowl, Bahamas Bowl continue, but have teams that are five and seven squaring off against each other or see those go away? Because I've always been a, we don't need so many bowl games. And I've said like, let's just do away with them. But then if they're gone. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never needed that many bowl games, but I've enjoyed that many bowl games. Like I, I, right. I will watch those, those little <laughs> ass bowl games between two, six and six teams. Cause you know, whatever, I'm just trying to get it in while we can, but you're wagering on them. So. Look, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. the more times I can sit down for West Virginia, Syracuse and realize that Will Greer ain't playing. And I can, I can, I can max bet that live bet button every which way possible regular line, alternate line team, total under the more give it to me all the time. <laughs> yeah. Like I that's, can't say, yeah, I, I can't sit here and see like, I will miss them, but. Oh, I don't my. want sub 500 power five teams, especially ones that just fired their coach. When we said anything goes in 2020 and two and eight South Carolina got invited to a bowl <laughs> game. Like, no, I don't. Did they really? I yeah. Guess. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, do, I don't want that. Now, the other argument is that a four and seven Mississippi state team was very, very eventful when they showed up for their bowl game. <laughs> so there can still be entertainment. But uh, in general, if you're asking the question about some of these other bowl games and five and seven teams, I, d I don't want sub 500 power five teams that have had a lot of losing. Also, then, like, ask them to be showing up for a bowl game. What if what if they just got rid of bowls in general and they only had the playoff? Don't like that. Uh, uh, Coca clip this. This is Tom Fernelli laying the seeds for a 64 teamer. <laughs> <laughs> I I haven't heard. He, uh, Danny, did you do you think that bowl trips are fun for players? Because I've not heard I've not heard players complain about going to bowl games. No, they're awesome. They're like an extended vacation. The only thing yeah. that I'll say is that in in the playoff era, they're not so much fun anymore. Then they're more like work trips, business trips. Because now I think some teams might hold true to that, but you don't travel as long. I mean, normally if you, you know, before playoffs, you'd go for five or six nights, first couple days, you're sightseeing, going to SeaWorld, going to the zoo, going to the children's hospital, taking in sites. They have like parties, welcome committee. Those still happen at some of the lower tier bowls, but now in the playoff field, coaches aren't going to be as as open to sure let's let them run around in the sun all day or go to the beach to do you know like fun activities out there they're going to be worried about oh is he going to have you know like exhaustion or dehydration coming yeah, in play. the playoff <laughs> you're not doing the wing eating challenge where both <laughs> offensive linemen are like no. going all head to head against each other There's no qu a question for coaches who listen to the show dms are open let us know you know how to get in contact with us if given the choice like with bowl games if your team misses the playoff you don't get a bowl game, but the NCAA still allows you to have those practices that you get. So another, what, 15 practice? How many practices is it? 15, right? So 15. Right. So you get 15 practices, but there's no game. Do you take that deal or do you want the game? Let us know. Hmm. What's your hunch? What do you say? Yeah. You, 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 I think they take My the hunch game is too. most are going to want the game, but yeah. I just, I, I wonder how many might be like, yeah, I, I'll take the, pre like a, a late winter practice before <laughs> spring practice to get ready for next season instead of an opponent. You know what I mean? I think the replies, <laughs> I think this is so situational because there will be coaches who like coming off a 500 year and they're like, don't, yeah, don't make me subject to sub 500, six and seven. And they know the squad they've got, maybe a couple guys opting out. They'd be like, nope. So I think it would be very much situational on a year to year basis with those coaches would want to yeah, do. That's, that's the thought. Like, I think a lot of coaches would rather get an extra 15 practices before the spring to prepare for next season. Right. Yeah. Do like, do the seniors have to practice would mm -hmm. be the next question. Yeah. Do you think that the kids would want to stay around and do that. Like, that's my thing is that the bowl game is part of the hook for getting them to practice more. A lot of these kids, if you're having a really poor year, I can pretty much guarantee they'd rather go home and see their friends back home. Like, oh, so do I. 
you know, if you didn't have the bowl game as, as, as the, the reason for sticking around, I think a lot of them are going to say, yeah, peace. I'm, I'm going to go home and, and, and hang out with, see, see my guys from back home. I'm just interested in what the coaches think. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Danny, you are coming to us live from Tallahassee. The group chat exploded with you in the iconic Sidewinder. I mean, just slingshot. I think it's slingshot. a slingshot, slingshot, right? Come on, get the name right. Dang it. <laughs> hey, listen, if Polaris wants to come and sponsor the podcast, then maybe yep. I'll, I'll get a better handle on yep. what their 2021 lineup is. What's the vibe like uh, around the football facility, around the, the football program? So yesterday I got in, drove up yesterday from South Florida, and I have a whole new appreciation for how many times my parents drove up like on a short week, a short weekend to drive and watch me play. And even though I drove it just as many times, like it was back and forth for school, you're going to be here for a semester. Like I'm only here for a few nights. It's a long drive. So shout out to them. New appreciation for that. So yesterday I just got in my daughter's doing golf camp over at the golf facility. And so she got rained out early. So I was planning on going over to the football facility, maybe tomorrow, Wednesday, kind of going over. I was going to pull her out of camp, give her a tour and like try to make it more official. But she got out. There was some storms in the area. So she got out at 7 as opposed to 8.30. There was still light. So I was like, hey, why don't we go over? I'll show you the football stadium. So we go over there. And I'm like, hey, let's get a picture in front of Coach Bowden's statue, which is right in front of the athletic center. So I get out of the car. And I'm getting ready to take a picture. And all of a sudden, I see a couple of the coaches. And they're like, and it was dead. Like, no one was there. And they were, like, right inside kind of hanging out. And they said, hey. They said, Danny, what's going on? I'm like, oh, hey, how's it going? They're like do you want to come inside? I'm like, sure. So like impromptu unscheduled tour of the facility for my daughter, got some pictures. We like Norvell was already gone. Coach Norvell was already gone for the day, but there were a bunch of assistants around and they were kind of, I think they were recapping like what has been a crazy and not only recapping, but they're in the middle of all these camps that are going on. So like the first thing they were like, man, we're exhausted. Like it's Sunday night. They just wanted to go yeah. home and they had all these campers here over that. They were like 4,000 kids have been here in the last week. And, I, but they were excited. Like there's definitely a positive mojo around the team around the facilities. Like they're showing me, you know, pictures of what they're going to redo and how they're going to redo the locker room and they're going to redo the players lounge. Um, so all of it, a ton of excitement, I would say, is kind of the, the key word. There's a positive energy that's around the program, which is exciting and also hard for me to register that excitement with a Vegas win total at five and a half. Like, so I'm like, what do I do with that? Because I'm very much I'm all in with the positive mojo. But then I'm like, oh, what is what is Vegas? They're, what, the bookmakers need to come out here and spend a day with me in the football facility. And maybe we'll bump it up. But I think they also are aware of the schedule. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got that same vibe also that they're extremely tired. Like I was texting some of those dudes because a lot of coaching staffs hit you up after you go to, to a two-day seven-on-seven at IMG. And they're like, how are you guys doing? They're like, we are beat. Like, because <laughs> they're – you know, they're, they're desperate. They haven't met, met these kids in person many, many times. Um, Danny, I think the, the best way to reconcile that is understand the excitement about the future. But in these camps where the players are working as counselors, look at the players that are working as counselors. You're like, oh, my God. Mm. Like, would this guy start at NC State? Nope. Would he start at, at Louisville? Maybe. Would he start at Miami? No. Like, they don't have dudes that are right. ready to help them in many spots on this roster. Like what's the NCAA's term going pro and something other than sports. You have a whole lot of that in Tallahassee on this current roster. But they're starting to sign guys, right? I mean, they're starting or not even sign them, but getting more interest from guys that maybe they haven't been in the mix for recently. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And they have the number three player in the entire country um, who is like just spent eight days in Tallahassee and is like their best recruiter by far uh, in, in Travis Hunter probably the first guy in a decade who legitimately uh, we would rank as the number one receiver or number one corner in the country, depending on what he wants to play. Um, so that's pretty helpful. If he's like a better recruiter than any of their coaches on staff and they have some decent ones on staff. He just, some guys he, are just he like, grew I'm, up loving Florida state, right? Yeah. He's a Palm beach kid. He plays in, he plays in Atlanta now, but yeah. Uh, Let me ask you guys something. Cause I, 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 I'm honest to a fault. The slingshot itself is that what you guys would be rolling out there to impress 16, 17, 
year old recruits. Because no. in my mind, it wasn't. But I'll tell you what might have changed. And I actually I sent you guys the picture. Me, I got in it. And they were, you know, they, they're very proud of the slingshot. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get a picture in it. By the way, it's really hard to get in and out of. Like an, like an offensive lineman, I don't know. Or the type of offensive lineman you would want blocking for you. I don't know if would be able to fit into it. But I was in, I was kind of mocking it. Now, I got it, saw it. There is a positive mojo around it. And so I asked my daughter, who is 14, so she's not that far from the, the age group that would be impressed by it. I was like, what did you think of that? She's like, it was cool. She's like, it's really cool. And I was like, okay. But if I, if I was a head coach and I was, and I guess Mike Norvell bought it, like it's his, like he bought it. It wasn't like the booster supplied it. If I was a head coach, I probably would have got the new Lambo like SUV and pimp that out in garnet and gold with the colors and the suicide doors. That's just me. Like then, I, but then maybe you don't want to have that disparity with your money and the player's money that much glaring in front of their face. So I don't know, but I'm coming around on the slingshot I'm coming around. I feel like your daughter was probably like, yeah, no, that's cool. And then dad gets in it. She's like, eh, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of it's kind of dorky now. Dude. No, I, mean, I got a picture <laughs> with her in it. Like we did it together. She liked it. It's cool. Isn't the slingshot more attainable? Like if if you had the tricked out Lambo, aren't we? I don't know the prices of these items, but I'm assuming that the slingshot is a a little bit more reasonable on the price tag, right? Yeah, but we're talking about somebody who's making he can afford either, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, is that is that a write off? By the way. Pro if he's using question. it to recruit, yeah. So then you the, definitely go for the Lambo. Is, yeah. and, re and remember, uh, like, so these football camps they're running are actually run through through his LLC, right? Yeah. Like, I don't know if people realize this, but all these camps happen over the summer. They're not run through the schools. They're run like you have to cut the school in in some ways, and you and the, you have to figure out the insurance stuff. But like, they're usually run through a, through a coach's company. And so then, are the assistants who help they're paid out through the LLC? Yeah, assuming. And then all other, I love all these questions I'm learning. Like Mackenzie Milton's out there helping, Jordan Travis out there helping. Can they get paid? They do. And they can even, before pre NIL, they can get paid, right? They can get paid, right. So they're paid out of Mike Norvell's LLC. I believe so, yeah. That's crazy. That's awesome. But I don't think anybody, <laughs> oh, it's awesome. I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. outstanding. But I think not a lot of fans understand that dynamic that could take place. When you see a slingshot out in the streets, are you envious? Because that's what I, when you said if you would you like the slingshot, I thought about being at like a a mall or you know like an outdoor shopping center or something, and you're sitting and you're eating outside, and then the slingshot comes cruising by. Like, do you, do you turn your head and say, "Man, that's awesome," or you do you turn your head and be like, "Dork"? <laughs> I'll let anyone else answer that. I'm skewed by where I live. I live in one of the most, and not me, but I live in one of the wealthiest counties, maybe in the in Palm Beach County. Like it's, you know, it's uber rich that live down there. So they would look down on a slingshot, but I don't think that's necessarily the case for everybody. That's where I skewed towards the Lambo that's there. I don't think coaches drive like the nicest possible stuff, by the way. Like but I, Jimbo I, doesn't save and didn't he have like the highest S class, yeah, but, he, but doesn't like he have a, the he own the dealership? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then, well, that, yeah didn't they, someone have the swag copter? But that was more. That was some. That was a thing. Remember at AM, he had the swag copter that would come into practice. Like I think that's got some status to it. They took that to high schools to, to get around like the Houston area uh, more efficiently on Friday nights so it could hit more high schools. It was hey, actually that's, that slingshot's pretty fast though. It is. <laughs> um, get around. Like, Willie Willie had an SUV. Uh, Jimbo had a black truck that had like the mossy oak camo stripe down the side of it. I know, I, I know he had a, he had a car too, but uh, anyway, I, slingshot is is different. I think it probably like depends on what region of the country you're recruiting and what kind of car you want to drive if you're a coach. I think that's fair. Oh, colder area, like you, you're not going to be driving some open air thing if you're recruiting in some parts of the country. No, I, ju I just, I feel like culturally, like if you're on the West Coast, maybe USC, Beamers. There's the lamp. Yeah, the, yeah. Beamers USC, are more. UCLA. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got Agreed. you. What, what car 
that could be our, if we do a podcast question from our official account, like which car defines each university best? Like what would their, what should their coach be driving oh to get gosh. their recruits? And maybe a slingshot's appropriate for Florida State. Maybe it's perfect. How many tweets will we have before somebody replies with, uh, with Charger for Alabama? <laughs> a lot it won't it will not take many it'll no, be one of the yeah. first suggestions yeah <laughs> what was, what's the first one that comes to mind for y'all as the answer to that question the school in the car <laughs> i'm not saying yeah I've, I've got virginia tech and a bronco i like you know? it i was gonna I, say I usc that. and a white ford bronco <laughs> <laughs> smu and a mustang literally yeah yeah Some, Something that you load up for the like the hunting, I was, or, hunting or fishing trip. I was thinking for the hurricanes because I see these all the time when I go down to Miami, like the old school hoopty, like with the not like 30 inch rims, like that's purple, except this one would be orange and green, the spinners on the side, neon lights, and maybe even bounces while it's going down the road. But that feels more West Coast though. So maybe not the bounce. Maybe that would be the West Coast one. Bud, what do you think? That's a pretty good answer. I did see an incredible one of those yesterday in Bradenton. I mean, it was <laughs> it had all to, over. It, it had to be like forty. So the, this thing's going to roll over when it turns. It, it was that they were like like candy blue, probably biggest rims I've ever seen. It was it was pretty impressive. I mean, couldn't you just see Paul Christ like on the biggest? Snowmobile? Yes, biggest oh, souped out like snowmobile that's out there that fits like four. It fits your entire family, and he's out there just rolling up to recruits on it. Yes, I say, that. No, I was gonna say Paul Chris is rolling around in a minivan, <laughs> <laughs> tried to stack as many linemen as possible inside. <laughs> if if you saw Paul Chris pull up to a restaurant in a minivan and the Wisconsin offensive line poured out. <laughs> I, it would be the greatest thing that I could possibly imagine as a hostess, you know, and, and whoever is waiting on the table is just like yeah. jackpot. Meanwhile, the chef, meanwhile, um, the chef's like, Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just go ahead and dump out everything. That's like pre-made and start making uh, backups. Yep. Speaking of being in Tallahassee, I was driving my daughter around yesterday and I was like, there's the olive garden. We used to go to, I used to take the offensive lineman there and we would get all you could eat breadsticks, pasta, and we used to destroy them. Like, I don't think they minded because we were there, but we used to apps like we definitely got our money's worth on that. The, God, how long would y'all stay? Because there's like the amount of food they can eat, but how fast would it happen when you're Pretty at one fast. of those? Like, yeah. Yeah. You'd be in and out in 45 minutes. No problem. Oh man. We, we would go to Sonny's in high school. Oh, and they yeah, had they had, they had all you can eat pork for like seven ninety nine after practice and it was like me and Stavich and Ricky Epps and and like it, there's no way they made money on us. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like just you, you just got the reorder in already. Like you, you oh you get like your like, your pork. Hey, let's go. Yeah, ahead, let's, let's keep go ahead it coming. S <laughs> send that send that ticket immediately. Yeah. <laughs> right. Coming up on the other side, we've got a quarterback on the move in the Pac-12 and. We want to try to identify some of the developments that helped shape this college football sport as we know it today. Next. A little bit of transfer news from over the weekend. Uh, Sam Neuer, the starting quarterback from Colorado, announced that he will be transferring to Oregon State. He's from Beaverton. He's from somewhere in Oregon. So uh, this is a little bit of a return home is the way that he uh, announced it on Twitter. So the Thing that makes this interesting to me we've been we talk about oregon state almost as much as we talk about kansas on here oregon state also had an excellent around the clock episode uh that bud got a good look at to talking about the beavers it's interesting because uh between tristan jebbia and chance nolan i i thought that that we already had our our conversation and our players and the part for that quarterback job um i guess bud i'll throw this to you first since you've been keeping tabs on oregon state definitely the the most recently of this group with Sam Neuer's arrival, how, how does that change? He's immediately eligible. He's got one year of eligibility left. Um, what, what does that make you feel about the quarterback situation, what Jonathan Smith has, and maybe even the fact that he wanted to go get uh, a player like Sam Neuer, what that might say about uh, both Jebbia and Nolan? Yeah, I mean, if they're really counting on, on, on him to, uh, to play quarterback for them, it makes me more concerned uh, about Oregon State because he really wasn't very good, I didn't think. Uh, but he also is a guy who was, he was a safety. Right. 
like maybe he could go back to playing safety for, for Oregon state. I I'm not trying to be flipping about this, right? Maybe they really see a, an undervalued skill. I, that's something I'm very interested with, with the transfer portal is maybe a school sees an ability you have or a skill and, and much like free agency and other sports, they want to bring you in and you know, like baseball with spin rate. Hey, I love how his curveball. They didn't have him throw the curveball as much you know, at the prior team. Let, let me use it more here. M- maybe there's something there, but um, I'm not trying to rag on, on, on a kid, but I, yeah, I just, uh, uh, not, not really doesn't move the needle here. Yeah. This is to me, I think this is more interesting for Colorado's QB battle. Okay. Like if he's leaving, you know, JT Shroud transferred in from Tennessee maybe he's had a pretty good camp. Maybe he's kind of, you know, taking some control of that job or maybe, you know, it's true freshman Drew Carter. So I, I think this says more about Colorado than it does Oregon State because I'm, I'm with Bud. I don't know if Neuer is going to be going into, into Corvallis and taking that job from somebody because he was all second team Pac-12 last year. But we got to remember. Jared Broussard was like that offense, right? Yeah. And we just have to remember what the Pac-12 season was. Like it wasn't a very – something we could probably take a whole lot and extrapolate from as far as, you know, future performance. He's also somebody that threw more interceptions than touchdowns. So I don't think he's just walking into Oregon state and taking over the starting job. And keep in mind, Carl Durrell put that team in an excellent position. If you look at the scores that, that, you know, grade the coaches based on, you know, what did, did you have like optimal, you know, run pass? And then did you, you know, how did you handle your third, fourth down decisions in opponent territory? Carl Durrell was like number one, which is really, you know, that's a way you can maybe steal a win more than we think you should probably have. And if you look at Colorado's underlying stats, that looks to be the case. They, they really were not that good of a team on a down to down basis, but they, they found ways on the margins to win some games. They probably made Neuer look a little better than he actually was. How do you track that decision-making stat that you just referenced right there? So uh, Garrett, McC- Garrett McClintock of BYU 24 uh, seven actually puts it out every year. So I'll, I'll find the link and maybe we'll drop it in the show notes. Um, that is very cool. I, I need to add it to my, my arsenal of, uh, of tools, but, uh, so keep your eyes on that, uh, Sam Neuer from Colorado to Oregon state. Okay. The biggest developments for college football. I, I liked that we kept this uh, a little bit broad. I've got, um, I've, I've got a list here and I wanted to do, do you mind? I mean, do you mind I'll if I go. just jump out here? Yeah, go. I, I I think that the most impactful development for the sport of college football is cable television. And while there's lots of different ways that you can trace it, the two that I want to focus on are uh, both exposure and revenue because cable television uh, on one hand allowed the entire country to see the entire country, you know, and if you are running a college football program, you're now going to be able to recruit in more places. You're now going to be able to get exposure for your program, which has nothing but positive benefits if, as long as you're winning. Then the revenue portion of it is what's so crazy because we get total chicken and egg scenario where the revenue is coming because you're getting more exposure and in doing your media rights deals, you have created the revenue that funds not just college football, but all of college athletics. Like those media rights checks being the backbone of college athletics while also being the reasons that schools are going to be able to recruit all over the country and have that kind of exposure, the national college football product that we have today, I think the most impactful development was cable television. You're correct. <laughs> Is that it? I mean, like the maybe, forward pass, air conditioning. <laughs> nah, nah. I, I, I think this is probably along the same lines as yours too, but I think the internet changed a lot too, especially as far as recruiting, because, you know, like we talked about it, but you go into the camps this weekend, it's the first time these coaches have had a chance to see any of these players in person. So we just went through over a year where they weren't able to see players in person, but they were able to at least get a decent idea of some of the kids through video on the internet. And I think that that's one of those things that as far as the recruiting angle, especially like before the internet came around college football fans cared about recruiting to a certain degree. Like they, you know, they followed it. Like there were magazines dedicated to it. Guys like Tom Lemming made a living doing it. But like once the internet came around, I think that recruiting and coverage of recruiting really blew up. And I think that that has changed the game a lot in that, like, you know, like, bud, you released the blue chip ratio today. Coaches pay attention to that stuff. We've talked about, like Urban Myers talked about how he checks the players' rankings of guys recruiting to see how his team is stacking up. 
I think that it has impacted the way that teams recruit, the way they approach recruiting, and how they're able to recruit players from outside their own area. So I think the internet in that kind of way has had a huge impact as well. I guess I'll piggyback that because that's exactly where, where I was going. Um, I I think specifically within that is is digital film and the quality and and the you know, the relative relative Efficiency. cheap price, yeah, of of quality cameras. I actually, I, I was, I had to go to a Buffalo Wild Wings on Saturday night to, uh, uh, to use their internet because my hotel didn't have internet, and I had forty videos to upload from from the seven on seven. And I, number one, I think if I brought my two year old to watch a UFC fight at like twelve thirty at night, my wife would totally beat my ass. Uh, <laughs> but it is it is cool to do in some circles i guess because there's there's a whole lot of that going on but <laughs> uh so where was it going oh anyway i put out a, a twitter question because i was waiting for some stuff to upload like who is the highlight from like the late 80s or the early 90s high school highlights that you really wish you could see that you've never seen and you know mine was albert hainsworth because apparently he had uh, 150 tackles as a senior and 51 uh quarterback pressures but only six sacks. I'm like, what is the, what is the quarterback just like slinging the ball away immediately? Like, how do you have 51 pressures and like 60 tackles for loss, but only six sacks? So oh, that no, was it's Albert. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That, and, I, and I really wanted to see Derek Thomas too, because he was a beast at Alabama from day one. Um, but the quality of the film on some of these players from the 90s is so bad that I do think it probably led to more guys falling through the cracks. And now you have a much better, uh, A, you're able to, to see the players in a higher quality. You're able to actually see who the linemen are, which is helpful as opposed to the super graininess that you had at the high school level for a long time. And even some of the early 2000s film is poor. The other thing is you used to have to go high school to high school and collect all these VHS tapes or reels if you want to go back even further. Now it's all digital. It's all in a database. I can have multiple members of my coaching staff watch it from their house, on the road, whatever, I can pull up the notes associated with, with all these clips and see, you know, or do we have them as a green light, which means we're giving max, you know, max communication to them, yellow light, which means keep them warm. We may have to take them at some point, you know, but like we're not ready to accept equipment right now or red light, which is like this kid's not in our plans ever. That, that has really changed the game. I think it is, it is made for far fewer sleepers who totally fall through the cracks. Like now, if you have good film, we're actually able to see what you did on it. So the digital film, both quality and availability is, is kind of my, my main one there. All right. I think you guys, I'm, I'm going to do like a, we take the good ones. <laughs> no, no, you guys definitely took the good ones, but I'll be like the guy in the first take meetings. who are like, all right, I'll take the other side. Been in those meetings before. <laughs> like, all right. all right, I'll take this one. Wait, uh, you so played a character in ESPN embrace debate. Let's go. <laughs> um, so I, so over the last, like, you know, doing all this talking that we do about the sport, mentioned a bunch like we're on I feel like we're on this massive precipice of change and while I don't think we knew it when cable tv started it was like a slow process all of a sudden I think we're on the cusp of this really dramatic change and the transfer is big but I think when we look back it'll be you know it's it's impactful uh the expansion of the playoff another huge cha uh, change which I think is impactful but I, I, the name, image, and likeness, I think, is a massive, massive change for the sport. Even just a little thing. Like Bud was saying just five minutes ago, talking about an Oregon State transfer. I hate to rip on him because he's just a kid. I think that aspect might change in some people's mind because, oh, he gets paid. He's getting paid a lot of money. Let's treat him like that. So I think that aspect will change. Coaching the uh, kids will change. I, and I do think in maybe 10 years – definitely 20 and maybe as soon as two years we'll look back and be like can you believe we suspended johnny manzel for a half because he took 30 grand or three grand from somebody to sign autographs like i i just and, but i also so here's the thing i worry about as well with this change because this is what we do in in politics and life and everything is we have this pendulum that swings back and forth and very rarely are we right in the middle and clearly we're seeing a massive shift one way and everything even though the name image and likeness is bipartisan there is a movement to have the players be actually paid not name image and likeness which go ahead and make money and not it won't be for everybody 
we're already seeing, and there was some some testimony before Congress last week of what about uni, uni, unionization? What about uh, you know about a piece of the pie? What about some of the revenues from the TV deals? And I just feel like that this name, image, and likeness will lead to that. And Bud made a comment a couple episodes ago about worried about the future of the sport, right? Like, do we even have this in 20, 25 years? And I think like this could be the start of something that looks dramatically different. I don't, it's not the name, image, and likeness, but it opens the door to a different set of mind thinking once you see guys posting pictures and actually, you know, with money and nice things. And for whatever reason that bothers people, it shouldn't bother you, but they'll start looking at them as professionals. And the more we do that, the further we get away from what we've always known college football to be, which was an uh, amateur sport of players loving it, you know, loving the sport and just want to play for that. So, like I said about expanding the playoff, you're turning it into a mini NFL. You are, but you're not. Mm. This we'll is a step like in the direction. Matter soon. <laughs> what about on field? What what some of the developments do you think? Uh, because I was I didn't think that we made any bad changes when we put in targeting rules. I mean, we still like have hand wringing about some of the specifics and the way it's legislated. But haven't we pretty much adapted and adjusted? And while it has, there have been a lot of offensive friendly rules especially when it comes to pass interference uh is, is there anything recently that feels like we've seen a big change in the way that the game looks see that's forward pass is, I, is like is forward pass the biggest on-field development it in is, terms of it's the been way around too long it's been yeah. around too long i do think rpos and the way the the, the lineman downfield i think that's a massive change yeah, the uh, clock uh, rules were a pretty temp, big change in the like middle part of the decade. Yeah. No huddle, like going fast. Cause that's the thing. Like a lot of like the RPOs, they're new, but they're just different takes on the same things that have always existed. You know, it's it's a triple option offense, except instead of three different running options, you've got a passing option now too. So it's I don't know, like I think you're right, but the clock stuff has changed a lot. But I don't know like what rules have really changed the game dramatically. I got mm. one overtime. Like as somebody who was impacted by a tie that we didn't get to go to overtime, I think uh, it's much better. You know, I think it's much better now that we actually do have a determiner. You know, we have a, we have a winner and we have a loser. And why not just, if you're going to do the two point shootout thing, like that they're implementing, just go straight to it. Why like, don't even time? mess around with, yeah. uh, if, cause we do two overtimes of starting at the 25 and then in the third, we go to the two point shootout or is yeah. it, after that i think it's the second one and it's like if if the reason you're doing you're making these changes is so there's fewer plays and the players aren't you know there's fewer injury risk then just go straight to it i mean it's that's what it's going to be most of the time anyway it's the two-point shootouts penalty kicks yeah Yeah, that's what i'm saying they should start at the 40 in my opinion that that would be so much better if you did because that way like a field goal is not assumed you give a little more time to play defense if you're an offense that is a little more wide open it actually caters to you as opposed to right now like you want to take the bigger team pretty much because everything is going to be in that compressed red zone area uh i i wish they would do that kind of like in baseball i wish they would not have the runner on second <sighs> i put a runner on first if you have to put a runner somewhere yeah like at least that you have to execute some correct strategy with the runner on second it's like you can have two really really poorly hit balls and you win the game if the other team just screws up even worse than you do yeah, the, what, two, what, the two options I like are like either start to get the 40 or do it where like you move the ball back five yards with each overtime or just do the blind auction. What's that? Where you ask both coaches separate from one another where they're willing to take the ball at and whoever's willing to take it the furthest from the goal line gets the ball. <laughs> Has anybody discussed that? <laughs> no, yeah. I've never heard that. Yeah, I care. But I think it's a. Uh, it might be Connolly who's brought it up. I'm not sure, but somebody has, I, I got it from somebody. It's, I think it's brilliant. I, I think that it's, I mean, just from football perspective, I think that it adds an entirely new element to it. But I also think that just from like our perspective, 
and second guessing coaches, which is every sports fans, you know, wet dream, their favorite thing to do <laughs> gives coaches something else to get yelled at by the fans. Like, why the hell didn't you just say the 35? <laughs> and now we've got uh, Ed Odron, who is one in six in the blind auction, you know, going up against <laughs> he keeps, Lane he keeps, he keeps bidding the one. opponents 10 yeah. <laughs> every Lane. time. Lane so there, just wants to win the bet, so he goes as far <laughs> away as possible every single time. There are charts for this, though, right? Like, mm -hmm. we know, based on your offensive efficiency, what the expected point total is per each spot on the field. So, is that, I mean, like, that doesn't mean that they're going to follow it. No, they, but I think you would get – I think very quickly you would get within a pretty predictable range, and it wouldn't be like somebody says a 30 and somebody says the 50. It would be like – okay, somebody says their own 26 and the other guy's like, I'm going to be ballsy. I'm going to say my own 24. Mm. Pretty much like, I think it'd be very, very close. Or you may even have some guys bidding the exact same. And then, then what, do we do? what do we do? Like a bid Home off? team. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned uh, the clock rules changing a few years back. Will you remind me, like, what were, what were those adjustments that you're identifying? So they went from... Uh, they, so they had like two, I was actually talking to Andy Staples about this a couple weeks ago. They went from the, what, the 42nd to the 25 and then the mm -hmm. clock that, that, that started immediately upon the ball being spotted. I think it was for hurry up. It was yeah. okay. Yeah. And it, it, it actually, it reduced the time of games. You remember this? And then they, they had some stuff that they actually, that they went back on. Cause the one year we had like six or seven fewer plays in the game. Uh, I'll, I'll try and find it. The, and the best part of it is it reduced the time of games, which then caused the networks to add more commercial breaks. Hey, hey, we like those commercial breaks, Tom. <laughs> we love those commercial it's breaks. It's funny how that's an games, example of something the, that's good for us, but maybe not good for the sport. I think the yeah. playoff is good for the sport and good for us, Tom. That's, no, okay. We'll see. Um, scholarship limits is also on my list just because, like, the, the days of having 115 players and the coaches that um, – were able to really thrive on that and the schools and programs that were able to just continue to get better and better and better on better uh, scholarship limits in terms of roster construction feels like one of the most impactful developments that has shaped the sport. And I think it shaped it in a good way, just because even though we still have those dynasties that overwhelm you with resources and uh, other manners, it, it at least does uh, create somewhat of balance in terms of the two teams that show up on Saturdays. I think that's a really good one. By the way, uh, since we talked about transfers, uh, a Caleb Evans is a really nice corner get for Missouri. I know Georgia was in on him, Notre Dame was in on him, and uh, Missouri had a good connection there, I believe, his former DB coach. That's like a high-level transfer for them and, and something that if you guys keep notes on teams, or I'll, I'll drop it in the spring cleaning doc, uh, but that, that's a pretty big pickup. Caleb Evans. Uh, a, a Caleb Evans. A uh, Caleb. A uh, Caleb Evans. Yeah, from Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Good player. Okay, good good pickup for uh, it's a little for Missouri. in the weeds maybe, but I just I, oh, Alpha Nerd's been doing some work. Alpha Nerd and Alpha Nerd's got it. I tell you what, I he's got a receiver, uh, Jamarion Wayne. First time I think any of us ever seen him in person uh, this weekend. He torched Midwest Boom for like three or four scores in the semifinal. Midwest Boom is probably like the, the best seven on team in the Midwest, and uh, even though he's from St. Louis, Jamarion Wayne was playing for Texas Elite, which is go figure. Uh, but uh, he's a good player. We we might have to revisit his ranking a little bit now that we've seen him in person and realize he's like almost six four and jumps out of the gym. Is he twenty two? Is it he's he's this cycle? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. I was like, I'll what position? We have him as an athlete. We were talking to him. He's like, well, I play QB, DB, uh, rush passer a little bit, receiver. I'm like, what do you think you are? Because we have an list as as an athlete, and until we saw him in person, like I don't know what his best position is. But now I'm like, oh, it's mm -hmm, it's receiver. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, well, yeah. good, good job on the alpha nerd getting it done. Any other developments uh, that that stand out that you want to make sure we get uh get out here in the discussion? I think early Maybe, signing period has changed. Ooh, the sport. Yeah, I don't even know how, it's too how early all to that know, changes. Though, yeah. yeah, or it's, yeah. It, it's changed the sport. It's just too early to know what those changes are going to be. I think and, I know. Tom, I would push back slightly in that I think I can tell you what one of the changes with it is. I'm just not sure if we can perfectly measure like the magnitude of that change yet. 
but but I think it has made it significantly harder for new coaches to rebuild. Yeah. Because you used to have about 12 weeks to put together your first recruiting class and you could actually You've got like 12 days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're basically punting on it. We're, we're looking at these first classes, even the schools, honestly, that, that are doing well with new coaches from that time, Florida A&M being two of them, go look at their 2018 classes, disasters. Like the, the schools are doing poorly, same thing. Um, those first classes these coaches sign, a lot of times these players are available for a reason and the reason ain't a good one, right? Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly you may end up seeing guys who just got hired just go all transfer. So, so they, don't, they don't make four-year mistakes on kids. I also have indoor practice facilities on my list. I mean, I understand. Hey, talk to some of these places that don't have indoor practice facilities and are getting rained out all the time or yeah, dealing with it, inclement weather. Has it you know changed it's, the game? Maybe. You know what sucks for the players? That was the best when you get a rain out day. You'd be like, yes, yeah. we have to do a walkthrough. We can't bang on each other. We're just going to go inside and walk this out. Oh, that was the best. You're going to you're gonna be regretting those indoor practice facilities when you have to travel north for a playoff game for once. Oh, <laughs> Cannot wait. Uh, he is Tom Fernelli. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3. You can follow him at Danny Canelli. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>